So welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us tonight for the artist talk. This event is part of a series of artist talks and conversations sponsored by the Division of Arts and Letters and the Center for Student Engagement and Intercultural Programs at Governor State University. I'm Rebecca Seifert. I'm the Assistant Professor of Art History here at GSU and I'd like to start by introducing uh, the moderator for tonight's talk, Joseph Tokumasu Field. For, uh, Professor Field is a New York-based museum educator and art history instructor, both in New York at the Guggenheim Museum and at the 92nd Street Y, and here at GSU. His research focuses on Japanese American art and Asian American identity. And our guest artist tonight is Miwa Neishi. Miwa was born and raised in Tokyo, received her BFA in sculpture from Niigata University in Japan, and her MFA from Kent State University, and she now lives and works in New York City. Her work, which draws inspiration from abstract expressionism, prehistoric clay figures, and calligraphy, just to name a few, has been shown in exhibitions in Tokyo, New York City, and Los Angeles. Miwa is going to start by sharing a little bit about her work, and then Professor Field has some questions to kickstart a conversation. Um, and in the meantime, if anyone in the audience would like to make a comment or ask a question, you can feel free to raise your hand or go ahead and type it into the chat box, which we'll keep an eye on. All right, so Miwa, welcome. You can go ahead and start sharing your screen whenever you're ready. All right. Hi everyone, I'm Miwa. And first of all, thank you so much, Rebecca and Joseph for introducing me to this great opportunity to speak. Um, so I am from Tokyo, Japan. I'd like to start from the slide of my hometown. I'm from Machida, Tokyo, where uh, it is in Tokyo Southwest side of the city. Um, it's kind of a very countryside. I, I want to talk about this because uh, it takes a, a very core inspiration of throughout my art journey. Um, if you are uh, familiar with Ghibli movies and have you, if you have seen Pompoko movie, that's uh, um, based on the raccoon story. Uh, they have this uh, location models around the Machida city where it used to be a lot of like farms and forest and um, the problem have rapidly uh, evolved and a lot of uh, nature has been lost. Um, so you can see, uh, but then Tokyo towers and metropolitan areas very close. And um, I, I put this a uh, little obanyaki, which is a uh, local food I wanted to share. <laughs> In Audio Technica, I put it there because um, their headquarters in Machida, so something that you can feel a little relate to. And here's my dad in front of the shrine. And after finishing high school, I start to go to Niigata University. Uh, this is very, um, this is a very different prefecture. It's six hours away from um, Tokyo, where uh, the rice field is um, very famous for it. They make most of the rice in Japan and make a lot of sake. Um, like I, I was in the Midwest and if you drive through, you see all these fields of corns. Instead of the corns, you, you can imagine it's a rice field instead. And in there using that big land, there are so many art projects happening. And like you can see in this picture, it's got uh, Yayoi Kusama's site-specific uh, installation sculpture. And that's part of the Ichigo Tsumari Triennale, Triennial. Um, so not just this um, art project in Niigata, there's several other um, art projects uh, collaborating with the local uh, communities or business to introduce art from the contemporary artist from all around the country. <clears throat> um, so the next slide. In the university, I um, also participated as a student to uh, make artwork. This uh, huge egg I made with the styrofoam. It has, um, uh, I 
I put the sound of nature from inside that you can actually hear and listen to like uh, creatures roaring or rain or cricket sound. So back then my basic question about art is about um, what is art? Is it artificial? Is it organic? If human being is a natural being, what is the borderline of uh, making things as artificial or is it organic? So um, this very contrasted idea um, started to reflect in my sculpture. Like here on the right side, this terracotta piece that I made for my BFA thesis show. Okay, so this is my thesis show in Niigata University. And um, I, I did a lot of uh, sculptures. Uh, this was mostly, well, all of them didn't have the bottoms. So I, um, what do you say, uh, in, uh, intentionally made it unuseful because I wanted to avoid making anything traditional or functional because of the criticism of um, craft in Japan is very strict in a way. Um, for example, as I make these sculptures and I started painting on these sculptures and teacher would say, uh, you can't paint on ceramics. It doesn't, it doesn't match like that for this material. So um, the traditional perspective always have this kind of restriction and expectation how to make art in Japan. So what is this beyond the rules of traditional material? Uh, um, I started to think and then decided I wanted to go for my MFA. Uh, throughout all the uh, applications that I, I did to a grad school, I did mainly in New York, uh, but the one school in Ohio picked me and I was very happy that I could get into it there. And that was my very first time coming to US in 2013 in Kent, Ohio. I actually looked up the Governor's State University campus on map and it seemed like it's very kind of a similar situation where the Lake Great Lake is right there above and like very close to the edge of the state border. Um, so I was the only Japanese student then. Um, it was a very small group of ma uh, master's students and in the sculpture especially, there were no um, women students either. So I felt a little bit uh, isolated. So I just decided to make art that was familiar with myself. So I, here I put the sculptures from my first pro, um, project of sculpture here on the left. And at the end is the master's um, artwork on the right side. In between this project on um, artworks, there's so many process of me understanding this cage or burden of a stereotype of being Japanese that I realized that I was putting on myself as I came to US. So I put the material beyond the tradition, um, like a tra untraditional material was something that I wanted, I felt related to as being foreigner and also not wanting to um, take over the burden of a tradition. Um, and also, in being in the sculpture program, um, sculpture is making a sculpture. It feels like it's a it's making a figurative thing. It's a reflection of a figure. It uh, naturally reflects identity as well. Uh, so I this I started to look at this um, relationship between identity and material. Miwa, can I ask you a question about this work? Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for showing it. It's very powerful work. Uh, I, thank you for being generous enough to show it to us. Um, 
the kind of shroud on the form on the left, what does what does the uh, letter say? Right. Um, so this letter is coming from uh, like a manor goal that I grew up in like schools that you have you're expected to be peaceful or loyal or serious and honest something that's very like positive that people put that try to put that into your personality as expected to be a good japanese person but then behind that i i was kind of lost like what do I really feel in this Japanese society um, while well, everybody else trying to push me this kind of um, ideal personality to me? When you're making this in Ohio, yes. Um, you know, it seems like that um, those slogans or those tenants that they want Japanese students to abide by, that would be like easily recognized by other Japanese people like immediately. But when it's in the United States, um, it's not it's something that could mean almost nothing or less than nothing to people. So it's interesting that that's what you chose to like enwrap yourself in because um, it doesn't have the same meaning in, the, in, in an American context. But I guess that's kind of another layer to your work. Um, it's just really, uh, very interesting. Um, yeah, thank you for answering that question. Yeah, absolutely. And um, at the, the the right side of the big picture, when I was working on the thesis, this actually I could put these behind the figure was something that was the progress that I think I did. I could put this. Um, cultural signifier behind me. It was like, first it was like a cage of this um, image that I have to become as a good Japanese person, but uh, it became something that's just a part of me. I don't know if that makes sense, but should I go to the next one? So yeah, most of the time I was feeling I guess homesick or thinking about home, what made, what used to make me feel home or comfortable and what is art um, supposed to be is that I, I kind of got out of a way that I didn't have to make anything nationalistic, but it's just this uh, cultural inference in country um, that uh, made myself also. So I started to look into this um, cultural uh, forms and blend it in, into my abstract drawings. Um, it, it started as like a very doodling uh, manner, but it started to evolve as a painting. And here you can see some uh, calligraphies or letters put together with um, very pop colors that I felt familiar with this um, animations that I grew up with. And throughout the time in uh, Kent State, I got to see this exhibition called Beauty Reigns in Acker Museum. And in there, I could see this Jiha Moon's paintings. She's based in Atlanta, Georgia, and she's from Korea. And um, she makes this kind of uh, temple painting form or Korean Buddhist temple painting with a very pop contemporary material in it. There you can see uh, some Korean language, but also uh, alphabets. And in other paintings, you can find something like Twitter's icons or McDonald's. It incorporates a lot of this uh, global cultural thing into a Korean um, traditional form. So it's, it's her, I was encouraged to see that she was doing this mixture of uh, her Korean, this, um, Korean culture in, inside the Western um, environment. And on the other 
side, you see some of Noguchi's sculpture it's called Calligraphics. This is after he had to, he had um, to learn, he got to learn Japanese tradition in Japan and made this uh, sculpture based on calligraphy, um, apparently. And he can, uh, just like I was um, thinking about calligraphy as a form, he actually made it into an abstract sculpture, um, made me feel like this, um, you, can, you can make this as an artwork. And I felt encouraged and inspired. Miwa, can I ask you a question um, yeah. pertaining to, you mentioned that you um, left Japan and did your MFA um, in Ohio. Do you think that there's any connection between maybe these two artists that you're speaking of now and maybe um, a sense of being in more than one place like Noguchi in the United States and Japan? Um, does, is there any connection there, do you think, that maybe that that's part of um, what you picked up, um, you know, leaving Japan and, and coming to the United States? Or mm -hmm. is it something that maybe you were thinking about already? Sorry? Um, I was just saying, these artists that you spoke of, like Osamu Noguchi, um, have like more than one home or studied in more than one place. Do you think that that reflects like your own journey maybe? And that's why oh. you're attracted to these artists? I'm sorry if it wasn't clear. That's okay. Um, yes, of course it's not this exact the same. I have both uh, Japanese parents that I grew up with in Japan, but it was kind of a confusion though um, that parents did bring in a lot of foreigners as like the homestay guests in the home while I was young. So I grew up surrounded by a lot of uh, foreigners. And also I had experience of like going to a Christian church in Japan and um, things like that. It's very foreign cultural experience in Japan. Maybe put me into this spot of like in betweenness as I grew up because it became part of me as well. So yeah, longing for a home, like an ideal home didn't really like, actually exist that I um, felt belonged to in home as well either. So if that answers Yeah, question. thank you. I like the way that you phrase that in between this. Oh, yes. <laughs> and as I studied art history in the MFA under uh, John Michael Warner, he uh, offered a class called Nation and Borders, and which is a great class. And he introduced me to this book by Trinti Mingha. She's a video artist, but she also writes a lot of books. And it's about um, immigrants and um, migrant stories, narratives, folk tales from mostly Asian countries, East Asian and Southeast Asian countries, and translated into English. For me, um, I got to read part of the Japanese old, old poems in English was a little bit of a eye-opening experience because like, I don't know if you have experienced, if you have to like take a classic literature literature class and then read an old grammar, it, it just immediately lose interest because it's really hard to relate to because you don't use that language anymore. So I had that difficulty to understand old Japanese poems like um, haiku or anything like that. And to be able to stand from the English perspective as equal as American readers to read Japanese poem uh, was kind of very refreshing and got to really connect to this artwork as is. And then I felt like me being Japanese became not a burden anymore. I can put myself in the equal 
spot as any other people that's ex expressing with different language. Um, so yes, this is a very important book. And then abstract expressionism became also another inspiration. Of course, um, because that was when a lot of the post-war war, um, immigration happened, uh, um, mostly in Europe and America, between Europe and America. And while they're merging culture and languages, they had this um, blending of home country and new country and how are they um, communicating to each other became very um, 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 abstract. <laughs> um, so I read about some stream, stream of consciousness and that kind of, I felt like it connects to haiku also and the formlessness of the reflection of as is, I put it as, um, that I read from Zen monks calligraphy, that if it's like a curse of a cursive or something, a line of something, mean for monk, mean for the mean something for the monk, but it could just look like a just a line. Um, but just as that is expression as itself. Oh, it's hard to describe, but just like you are listening to jazz. It's very abstract, but if you get the pattern of it, you start to understand it. And these things, uh, even the graffitis, I started to connect into so many things, this communication or action of making things as a reflection of the inner self uh, felt very universal. Miwa, Hi. when you were um, finding a lot of these influences, yes. were you finding them mostly on your own or was it your professors or was it your classmates or the other people in your program? Like, where do you find all your sources or how, where do you draw from? I mean, I feel like a lot of people wanna ask artists where they really draw from. I think a lot of them is throughout the, you know, I don't know if it's necessary from class, but I think I, I, I was more honest to what I was interested in. And yeah, and, and trying to dig deeper and deeper and deeper and why I'm interested, why do this person speak to me? Something like that always like linked to each other and kind of connected it in my brain somehow. So it, 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 came, to, it came to me in a way. <laughs> That's great. Yes. And yeah, I was so interested in abstract that the initial idea of abstract came for me was this anxiety of not being at home and not being able to portray myself as I, I was able to in Japan. So that kind of keywords, right, um, highlighted it. And I got this book in this thread bookstore in Kent. Um, Harold Rosenberg, I believe is a critic and he published it in 66, right? It's kind of old, but he puts a lot of um, stories of uh, back then abstract artists anxiety stories and he kind of makes sense of why he makes this um paintings i love that you're digging around in the thrift store and finding this book <laughs> it's so influential like it's just like it's just very cool thank you yeah i um i guess i should read that sentence i quote i wanted to quote so the anxiety of art is a philosophical quality perceived by artists to be inherent, inherent in acts of creation in our time. It manifests itself, first of all, in the questioning of art itself. It relates to the awareness that art today survives in the intersections between popular media, handicraft, and the applied sciences, 
in that term, art has become useless as a means for setting apart a certain category of fabrications. At the last, that art object, including masterpieces of the past, exists under constant threat of demo deformation and loss of identity. So to me, right, um, by coming to the US, I guess I was scared that I was losing my identity of being Japanese or I was belonging to Japanese because as long as I put myself as a Japanese person, I feel like I can no longer blend in with anybody else here. Um, in middle of the Ohio too, of course. Um, so that was like a threat to me and I didn't know how to put myself in the position in between. So that was why I connected it to this book, I think. There it is, okay. So going back to my practice and remembering what I used to do and what what kind of practice or what kind of environment made myself, me as an artist is this, uh, I remember this uh, calligraphy, drawings, writings uh, in school since first grade, uh, teachers put you in assignment to practice hundreds and thousands of times to repetitive practice of writing these letters. And I, I thought this, this is why uh, I'm for, Japanese people maybe come up with this shapes that's like kind of form formalized in like a soft and very, I guess, harmonized because we were educated to make letters, write letters very proportioned and aligned in this box or um, this placement of each parts of the letters. Um, and you can see already all these artists started to make the uh, calligraphy into paintings or even Takashi Murakami, um, he refers to the emoji paintings. Um, in fact, emoji actually is from Japan. Emoji itself as a word, a picture letter in Japanese. So it's just a, a nature of um, how Japanese people look at the, as an art, I thought. Here on the right side, this is Hayao Miyazaki's Spirited Away background. And there you can see a lot of letters here. Am I going too fast? I don't think so. Okay. I just wanted to ask you maybe one question about if um, this like the letter forms that represent a flower or just even this kind of expression, is it also maybe related to your, I, your thinking about nature versus artificial or maybe that this is a way to kind of think about those ideas together? Uh, I didn't, I never really thought about it in that way before. Oh, that's right. Um, well, this actually, Oh, yeah, because it's, I said I put the flower. Um, it is part of it too. Uh, because it's almost like um, the object or the the thing in nature is is nature, and then the letter or the the word that represents it is like the artifice or the artificial part. I don't know. It's just I think yeah, got me thinking connects, about it. Connects back to Shintoism too. Okay, a lot of them. Shinto, Shintoism wasn't a religion per se. It was not until Buddhism came in, it was more like indigenous belief that they worship nature, thinking for the crops and, you know, food from nature and things. So yes, it, it was, it's very close uh, to, the, our custom and lifestyle is very still close to nature, that they appreciate nature as is. Um, yeah, that's a good question.
I think that's okay about this slide, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I graduated the Kent State University, thank, thank you, and then uh, continued. I tried to find the way that I can make myself involved with art. So I started making paintings, but then um, if, if I want to put this in public, I don't know how to put it. Is it a calligraphy or is it paintings? So I was still like juggling these two ideas again. So it's the drawings. It's actually layers of different cut out drawings here. I zoom out photograph and then this is just painting on the paper. And here you can see I just used the sumi ink, but then spray painted on it and made a drawing over it and um still very stream of consciousness kind of painting here and on the right side you can see uh cut out panels also i did cut out with jigsaw and i tried to get away from the traditional form of canvas into cut out paintings and I did make these in my artist residency in 2016 after graduation at the Paul Art Space in St. Louis. Just very close for you, I think. And before I I did go to you, I did come to New York City after that, but I wanted to uh, mention about this workshop that um I got to experiment how I can put this letter thing in public. How can how can I involve other people to um, access to letters? And I made this cut out parts of the letters for people to make a collage and make letters, expecting that something like letter looking thing would come out. But then it didn't, everybody didn't know how this um, parts would go into, is this an upside or is it bottom side? So they would put in like, not in the order of how um, Asian people would um, recognize as a letter. So it was very interesting. Um, and also made the coloring page that have, a, it has a flower drawing flower drawing inside the letter of flower in Chinese character. And beside that, I have hiragana sayings hana as a Japanese and the flower as a meaning in English. Um, I'm sorry. And How I, was the response um, to this kind of like social practice work? I, I felt so happy because there are a lot of, there are some Asian communities in Ohio and uh, I think the kids very, kids had fun with it. And I really, I was happy that I could offer something that was not necessarily sushi or hibachi or ramen that's already existed. Uh, it's kind of different angle of the culture that I could um, put it into um, interactive uh, thing. So, yeah, I think people really enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to ask because this is one of the parts of your work that I really like is like the use of language. Mm -hmm. And I know um, in Ohio, and you mentioned that there's not so many Japanese folks, but just maybe um, Asian folks in general. Um, Maybe were there was there any specific response for them? Because it seems like that that's like a great um, outreach um, and definitely a good connection to like a smaller, uh, sometimes marginalized community. Right. Um, yeah, definitely. Because there are not many Japanese people, uh, but there are many Chinese students that live around in the campus. So they they were very interested and uh, started just talking to me and uh, saying, oh, that's Chinese, that's Chinese. 
And then I said, oh, yes, this is Chinese, but also we use Chinese characters as well. And they seem to not to know that Japanese people also use Chinese letters. So there are already some kind of separation that I didn't know about um, that I, I got to learn, yes. So I got the green card and got to work. I got the job at the Kai Kai Kiki at Takashi Murakami's studio in 2016. There's a gap age because of my visa, but there uh, I could directly work mm -hmm. as a translator for assistants and office in Japanese staff. Oh, well, directly from Takashi to American staff translation and studio production of course um it was from 8 30 in the morning to six o'clock a full day five days a week job i was just graduated so i i was uh, willing to take anything but uh it was very hard <laughs> and it was also hard to see other um talents that's kind of being consumed for this uh, huge project that um, for one guy's business. But I think it was a good, <laughs> after all, it was a good effect, um, good time for me to learn and experience that. Um, and yes, looking at that, uh, the productions, I put that uh, acrylic painting there, seeing um, their um, acrylic painting as a process they have to like drain painting waters and it's kind of toxic material uh, drain in the sink every day every day um, while we're looking at this environmental problems and it was it was I felt like this is not going to be good and I didn't want to be part of it so I decided I'm going to make a switch to something a little more uh, close to the organic material. And I was also interested to go back to this traditional craft thing. And I switched the job to Ipodo Gallery. Um, so there, yeah. Is there, I'm oh, sorry, do you have any questions? I mean, I always have questions, but I mean, if you want to continue on, I, I do have a little tiny question. It's about if you were, um, would you ever see yourself in control of like a large studio operation like Takashi Murakami, or do you have to have your hands in your work? You know, would uh, you ever be in charge of a room with like a translator and a whole production line? It, it was super strict. I, I understand, I completely understand him for being controlling of how his artwork being made by assistants. Um, if I would be in that position, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't expect so much perfection of other people's work. I wouldn't make artwork that has to be perfect. Right. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Okay, so the contemporary fine craft. Yeah, it's very uh, different world of view here in the gallery. Um, I was selling tea bowls that was like $6,000. All this patron, I was so impressed that already so many American um, clients know so much about Japanese tea ceremonies and traditional cultures. And, but then also there are not so many encouraged younger generations that continue to make art uh, craft in Japan either because of this uh, very strict hierarchy um, in Japan. So that was also this um, difficult thing that I learned. So back to my art, journey, I started to make these cups by ceramics. I have always been avoided to make these functional things, but I was finally encouraged to 
continue this um, culture of making crafts with my abstract paintings. And of course, it doesn't look great here. I, I also felt like making cups are like sculptures. So um, like you can see here, I made a, a hiragana U as a flower vase. Um, it's very uh, playful. This is a series of You Know Me and Sake Cups with the hiraganas and also a sculptural objects here. To me, making a cups is something that you can put inside your lady life. So it's not something that you have to go look at it in a gallery or museum. It become part of your life. So that's something that I was interested to put my art in and decided to make all these um, cups. Yeah, so I keep talking about hiraganas and katakanas, uh, hiraganas and Chinese characters. So I wanted to explain a little bit about how it became a letter in Japan from Chinese characters. So in the prehistoric ancient Chinese letters on the very left, you can see it's like a pictograph of a person into this Chinese character kanji here. So um, that, that's part of the reason why I was so interested if a person from any background have to draw a human or something, it could maybe look something like this. And that doesn't define you as a Chinese. It, it just, as a person, very honestly drawing things and try to uh, communicate that with the other person. And I felt that's very, um, I don't know, opens, opens up the, the wall of culture, I think. Uh, it's very accessible. And the hiragana, I keep talking about the Japanese hiragana and you might have seen it in my drawings here. It's a phonetic uh, alphabet in a way. It came from the shape of Chinese characters, kanjis. So here it's a, e, u, e, o here. So that's that. And again, it's very repetitive, but I keep trying to make you um, put this culture or my element of what I feel home with uh, to things that I can make and trying to put, put it back to ceramic material. Also at this time I was um, drawing or copying a lot of uh, kimono patterns in like kimono patterns is very geometric and some of them even have the meanings of like uh, snow or um, a hemp we hemp uh, hemp what do you say leaves and or like a prosperity something like that it has a meaning in the patterns you know like any any other culture too maybe. And so here, I, like I showed you before, the Chinese ancient calligraphic scripts um, and looking at the Korean folk art that was also using Chinese character into their paintings and looking at the mochi base, mochi base from Peru, it has, it's, it's a little bit wide, but I want to put this all in one form. That was like my goal of this communication to an art object. This is a cuneiform script of clay tablet um, that you can see from a metropolitan 
museum, I um I wanted to how um sorry, <laughs> started to feel so hot. Um I wanted to put this into my work, so I decided to um, create a similar stamps and make into tea bowls. Am I taking too long? It's okay. No, I think you're doing great. Okay. I just think that there's just so many very like strict and formal intersections with um, what our students are learning this semester, like around cuneiform and language. So I'm just th so thankful for this presentation because I mean, you're talking about so much about civilization and covering yeah. so many interesting points. Well, it's 2020 and 2021. We have so much, so much history that I, we have to absorb and like, and continue this history of art. And like, how am I gonna put this in my work is always my thinking and yeah. So in 2018, when I got to visit my home, I got to see this exhibition about Jomon pottery in Tokyo. Metropolitan Museum. And they had a huge collection of every region's Jomon discoveries. And in Japan, you can't take pictures in museum, but here there was like a photo, um, photo free place that I could take picture of. <laughs> and Jomon means rope and pattern. Uh, pattern can also mean as a letter. So, you know, Jomon was actually named by American scholar. Um, yeah, but there you can see a lot of ropes patterns in the art objects. And this is uh, 10,000 years ago, right? It's very super, super old. Um, but then looking at this object and then thinking about people that's all it, that's making this artwork was very touching to me. Um, it, everything had some kind of meaning back then. And if I keep looking at these like pots around it, there's patterns of either a fire or it's wave, or something that's very rhythmic call and um, I felt that they were actually trying to uh, make something that's communicatable through the form. And of course, this is before letters coming into Japan. So it's very like indigenous to Japan, Japanese um, art. And I wanted to somehow connect to that also. Meanwhile, I, I'm pretty interested in the Jomon and the Jomon period as well. Do you think that one of the major reasons you connect to it is because it's uh, Japanese or it's like one of the earliest known Japanese civilizations or, or is it maybe related to some of the other things that you're looking at from all different places? Or do you think that it's closely related to being like what some people might consider like truly Japanese or original Japanese or something. You know, I don't believe there is any truly Japanese ever <laughs> because people moved around and, you know, it's all mixture. I feel like Japan is actually kind of like New York. Everybody came in and tried to make their own home and blended so Jomo actually shows this kind of non-national um, human creativity that has no restriction of being any kind of category that um, I feel very uh, free from it to uh, think that it, had, it actually happened in Japan and that I want to uh, sort of take over that spirit. <laughs> That's very cool because maybe because um, it's not so specifically Japanese, at least for you, maybe then it speaks louder or maybe it speaks beyond just 
people feeling like nationalistic about it, that it's kind yeah. of a, a universal thing or a thing from uh, for many time for many ages. It's just so unfortunate. It's very confusing that we have to call it Japanese as it, the same as like a national word. Um, I wish it wasn't. I wish I wish there was other word to say, but I guess it it, it shouldn't either. I don't know. Um, but yeah, nationality is definitely uh, something very artificial. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so juggling this ideas, figurative, not functional, and then calligraphy and abstract um, started to make sculptural vase. Here I put together most of the pieces that was more looking like Jomon potteries, uh, especially the one in the left top or in the center too. But um, yeah, I think by making something similar to Jomo, I was trying to read or assimilate myself to how it feels to make things that's similar to Jomo pottery. So uh, that was a good practice. And some of them started to become a little bit architectural on the right side. There's like a grid, four-legged, it's still a flower vase. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is, um, yeah, sculptural vase. And of course I can't ignore the, the letter part, the um, calligraphy and characters that I grew up with. So I wanted to put that also back to, um, how I make this into a um, sculptural vase. So I made these sketches um, and I started to create uh, ceramics uh, directly from the drawings. These are very small. It's, it's probably about the same si uh, actual size on the screen. It's very small. And here I made a bigger vase. It's called Flower Rangers series. Um, here, uh, very, very colorful. Um, one, one of the reasons that I make things colorful sometimes to make things interesting. Uh, so it looks like a characters, right? And it's definitely coming from like a superheroes, rangers. That's why I call it rangers. Uh, uniforms, this kind of like look like a Batman or <laughs> it looked like um, anime characters into a flower vase. I put it here, Ikebana as a flower arrangement here. I'm also kind of coming back and forth with traditional culture with contemporary forms. And these are more recent works. Um, I started to use more red clay again, and I call this one is a dancer. So it's on, um, I call it here and there. It's like a direct, directing flip side. And outside. Um, but yeah, it's it has sort of this connected lines coming from drawing hiraganas a lot. And some of them does look like uh, characters. And a lot of them started, to, um, a lot of them have legs, like standing by legs, which is kind of important for me to signify is as an art figuring. Here is a picture that's featured in the article of Mezzanine Journal. Um, an editor in the Milk Magazine found me in the studio and she wanted to have a picture taken of my pieces. 
So this is that. Some people say this still look like Jomun potteries in a way, especially this um, piece in the center. Any questions so far of the recent pieces? Okay. So larger piece. So every piece is like a trial for me, of course, that um, it doesn't always come out well, or it doesn't come out as like, I'm um, as easy as I'm just drawing a line by pencil or brush pen. So with the ceramics, I start building and building and then start to, I can't stop it and it become like this kind of uh, chunk, but it's all hollow and you can also still use as a flower base, but um, this is kind of a sketch to me. And here, uh, a little more recent piece, I called it, uh, I started calling them as a moji base. So moji as a letter in Japanese and uh, sort of, it's not literally representing any specific letters, but as um, just like the ja Chinese script of human letter, it's, uh, it's this, um, it's a shape of figure in a way. The picture on the right is uh, from the picture taken for exhibition 2020, uh, shown with the Aya Kakeda artist from Japan also. And this was exhibited in Sculpture Space New York City. This one is the largest piece that I've made in can't remember how how tall it is. I think it's over 10 inch. I think it's close to 20. I'm sorry. It is pretty tall. Okay. I want to show you some of uh, making process images here. So I'll start from the legs here and have a little bit of a body and close it up and make it into a form like this with a little opening. Um, it's important for me to sort of, um, to have this kind of opening like you can see in other shapes here, that it, it's not strictly just the flower base, that something that you have seen as a traditional form, but it's, it's still a sculpture and I want people to interact with the sculpture in as a flower base. The clay as an ancient material and glaze and shape as a modern mix of the past and present. That's how I connect um, to this present work. I just made this piece in next uh, in last month. And okay. transcend, transcend the time and space of the nationality or artificial frame of tradition. Moji shape, shapes as the characters of the moment and memory for the future. So this is also the recent piece that I have been making. Um, I'm starting to uh, use the glaze and brush a little bit more meaningful rather than just coding the piece. So on the left side, you see some brush marks. I started to like trace how I start these lines of shapes with the brush and then the glaze actually shows those stroke marks. And on the right side, you have been seeing this kind of grid pattern. Oh, sorry, not this, yeah, great uh, grid pattern. I um, wanted to incorporate, incorporate the gold leafing um, background of Japanese painting from Takashi's 
Takashi Murakami's paintings or traditional Japanese paintings because it's just a signifier of the history. And yeah, that's, that's um, what I'm working on right now. That's fascinating. Meanwhile, are these um, works specific characters um, like in kanji or are they um, maybe related to like some of the like languages and, and lexicons that you've developed? Are these like your designs for letters or are these potentially recognizable letter forms? Um, some of them have, a, I get the hint from the actual letters um, but then I also develop my own kind of shapes too, like, um, so it's maybe like the beginning point is like a letter form, but it's doesn't constrict you. Like it's, it's useful, but it doesn't, it's, it's not what you're communicating. It's not a letter. It's based on a letter form. Exactly. But it's, not, it's not, you could, you couldn't read this though. Exactly. Okay. Wow. That's very interesting. So however people can read it is however that is, but I I do have a little bit like, like this one looks kind of like a person and that's all I want. You know, nothing more, it, nothing less. If you can see this as like a person, then that's great. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but I, I was personally looking at this as like a moon here. But then I don't know if it could, it could or a star. I mean, yeah, it's star and moon actually. But um, I don't know if anybody could see it, but some people might in, in 10,000 years later, you know? <laughs> You mentioned a lot of times, um, and it seems like it's definitely in your work, is patterns and forms of communication and maybe even patterns as forms of communication. Uh, it's definitely a, a strong direction to go from. Where, where do you think that that comes from? I mean, I have thought about it and I always kind of relate it back to Japanese visual culture like the family crests and things that you've talked about, but um, is there any other places or is that part of your search to find different examples of where people are using um, kind of nonverbal communication? Mm. Oh, um, all over, like Egyptians, uh, pyramid drawings or um, it's all over the country, I think. And yeah. Um, some of the other things that I had to ask you about, um, since we're looking at um, this last Moji series, because um, it speaks to maybe like a lot of um, the different areas of your work is this idea of um, functionality or something being useful or not useful or how you use something or even how we engage with art. Um, it seems like it's something that you've always kind of taken through with you even before school and after school. Is it something you're still thinking about now? Yes, yes. Um, so uh, how should I start this? Um, like in Japan, naturally art culture wasn't art culture in the West, right? It's, it wasn't, it was not something that people that collect or maybe they, they, it was not like this in the art world here, but people made a use of time when they were not working in the farm at home. Of course, um, uh, it's not just Japan, all these farming countries in different countries too uh, made these crafts and developed itself as a culture. And I wanted to keep that way than making 
something that's not affordable or kind of uh, I'm talking about Takashi, but some, something that separates people from different society. It's not, it, it, it shouldn't be the way the art is, I thought. So it's a, for me, um, very conscious decision to make things that's functional. And I can also share it with other people from maybe um, my age or younger, um, just so that they can, I, we can share what we feel familiar with outside of the, um, the cultural strict restriction, you know? I mean, it's definitely, if you allow me to say this, it's definitely one of the large strengths of your work is how uh, many people can be drawn into it and that it's not, um, I mean, it's, it's inclusive and it's universal. Like those are the parts I definitely uh, enjoy most. So it's definitely a, a great part of your work. Um, maybe another kind of question I could ask is about um, your use of scale. It seems like um, you've worked on a large scale. You've done things that engage the public. Um, you've gone um, from things that go on the wall to things that are definitely designed to take with you or to be in your daily life. Mm -hmm. um, are you thinking about any scale changes or um, are you pretty much working in this scale that we're looking at, at the, for the Moji series? Depends on the demand. <laughs> uh, if there is anybody that wants a large piece, I would love to make that too. But um, physically it is very hard uh, and I, yeah, I don't want to stress myself too much <laughs> trying to make things that's like very hard to make. Um, but I used to make a really large piece in back in the college too. Um, so I don't know if if there if there's a chance that I would love to, depending on the location and the demands come from. And I I also want to like really um, push other people to make art more and encourage artists to be artists, you know, live as an artist, not as an, a worker for something that they don't have, they don't feel passion to, uh, you know, um, I think it's, it's very important to treasure things uh, not disposable or, you know, cheap, cheaply made. It, it doesn't, it's not very, uh, it doesn't make art survive. So I hope that my work could um, encourage and motivate people to make their own artwork as well. Miwa, it looks like we have a couple questions from the audience. Um, Professor Jankowski, who teaches printmaking here at GSU, she asks, what type of studio space do you work out of? Yes, uh, I work at a space called Sculpture Space, New York City. It's located in Long Island City, and it's a huge, huge space they uh, made from a um, laundry warehouse uh, and became a ceramic studio, and they have 40 something member artists that work together and we share tables and kilns together. And um, please um, visit their website, their, their space is beautiful. And maybe that kind of uh, translates into the next question or leads us into the next question, which is from Shannon Murphy. Um, she asks, how do you get playful in the studio and maybe with so many other people in the studio at the same time? <laughs> It's a little easier. I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, well, we do enjoy like conversating with other people, other artists, each other, of course. But sometimes we put headphones and just put it inside your own mood and like just start working as well. So yeah, it just um, I, I keep making and that becomes just playful as it can be. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, and I'm going to jump in here with my own question. And I know Joe has some more questions of his own as well. But um, I was kind of curious about the business side of things, because I think for a lot of our students and for art students and artists in general, this tends to be a big looming question all the time. Like you want to make your work, you want to be creative. And at the same time, you need to make money and you need to, you know, yeah. pay the bills. So um, what are your thoughts on finding that balance between being a fine artist and also trying to promote your work and deal with that business side of things? Definitely. That was the longest struggle uh, for me too. Uh, well, I think I started to come up with my own like idea that I want to bring it into public first. And I had to, of course, practice to make the quality good, to be sellable. Um, and then if, of course, if it sells so much that I have to always catch up and make this work that to, you know, to sell, it's not good either. So I do try to keep myself, I save myself a time that I can make my own work aside of making piece that's sellable. But this part, the, the making, sell sell or making a living part doesn't necessarily have to be about your work about your art either like i i used to work full-time jobs um and then make my own work in the week, weekend or after work and that's how i developed my art so as long as the job that you pick is enjoyable and healthy enough for you to make art that's good. And then um, really slowly, slowly start testing how you can promote and sell your work. Even if it's like a $10 sketch or piece that I showed you, this little um, piece or something like very, even if it's super domestic, crafty, I don't know. Um, anything, people, if people start, um, carry interest, then you can just keep going for it. And uh, I think it will, it will, it could become a career. Oh, and Mia Smith is asking, what's your website for purchasing your artwork? <laughs> See? <laughs> well, I didn't, I, I had to put out my website, online shop on my website. But if you, um, if you go to my Instagram, in my bio, there's a link tree and I put all the stockist websites that directly connects to the selling page or shop page of each stores. So maybe you can find from there. Yes. Or you can always reach me to reach out to me too. Any other questions from the audience? Otherwise, I can also pass it back over to Professor Field to uh, pose another question of his. <laughs> Thank you for all that questions. Yeah, those were great questions. I really liked um, Shannon's question about play because that's mm -hmm. definitely a big element in your work and one of the nicest parts of it. Um, yes. I'm happy to answer, I mean, to ask more questions. Um, but we, what time we're finishing relatively soon. But if there's more questions um, in the chat, I'd love to hear from those just because, um, you know, there's, there, there's, I, I wanna share the, the mic. Yeah, absolutely. And I do see we have another question in the chat box from Professor Cambrick who teaches ceramics at GSU. Um, <laughs> she, she says, you play between dual worlds in your work, like flat and sculptural. I really enjoy the tension between hard and soft. The pieces seem robust and cuddly, but then the reality of the hardness of the clay and the grid lines creates a lot of duality. Yeah, that's a good point. You want to speak a little to that, Miwa? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, it is. It is very repetitive of this coming back and forth between 2D and 3D. And the, all these works are on um, two surface rather than 3D. So in a way, I feel like I'm making a, 
a sculptural painting. Um, I wish I had a piece here. But uh, yeah, it's oh, I'm I'm always like this playing in between, like the sides. I think it. I don't know if it's something come to coming from a, the very flat screen culture. I don't know that maybe I should uh, study again about that. But I remember my sculpture teacher in Kent State told me all the sculpture that I make always have a flat surface. It's not 360 degree sculpture. And I don't know why, but it's it's always like that. I just have this one side and the other side kind of. That's interesting, just going back to so much of your influence. And I thought it was so interesting to see kind of like the lead up to the discussion of the ceramics because you kind of see some of the many different types of sources of inspiration that feed into this work. And a lot of that really is two dimensional inspiration. Like mm -hmm. you were talking about the calligraphy and film and, um, you know, anime and manga and um, some of your early drawings. So that note about the flatness from your professor is kind of enlightening in that regard. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't sure if that's a positive or negative thing when he was telling me like, why should I fix that? Should I make a 3D sculptural thing? And yeah, it kind of puzzled me, but that could be just an honest description, you know? I don't know, yeah. But something like that teacher's criticism is just a state of facts or truth that kind of like hurts, but later it keeps speaking to you and I, I, I go back to it and think about it. It's a good, good, um, a very, very good thing, yeah. Well, we have just about 10 more minutes left if we want to ask any other questions. Oh. Um, yeah, and it, just as a follow-up, Leanne says, uh, Professor Cambridge says, seems also connected to you having your foot in two cultures constantly translating back and forth. I do have a couple of other slides. Mm -hmm. So yeah, well, I wanted to say thank you, but I also had um, extra slides. You can find my work at the Noguchi Museum, museum shop. Um, the right picture on the right was the um, picture from the last year. And currently it's in a different location, uh, shop, original shop location on the left picture here. So when you have a time to visit New York, maybe you get to see my work at the Noguchi Museum. Which is a great honor for me. And then other slide. Yes, I wanted to um, add inspirations. Saburo Hasegawa, he, he, him and the Noguchi was a good friend and Noguchi Museum three, four years ago actually made a great exhibition about them both. And it was it was nothing like what I have seen ever and before or anything. I didn't know anything about Saburo Hasegawa growing up in Japan. And yeah, uh, his books, is, uh, I really recommend. He talks about Zen Buddhism and tea ceremonies. And, uh, but he also taught in America too. So it's a very interesting book. And Keisuke Serizawa is also an artist that I wanted to show. He, it's all he he was in active in like twenties forties, uh, around the Minge movement by Soetsu Yanagi. He did a lot of book covers and textiles. Something called a uh, stencil dyeing. Katazome is the way he um, dyed the textiles. 
And here you can see he actually did this kind of abstract with letters. It's alphabets, hiraganas into a pattern on the fabric. But these artworks are some considered as like not high art in Japan, being called as minge, maybe maybe similar to a folk art term of the folk, folk art. Um, but I think folk art or minge are actually um, shows a lot of lifestyles of people back then and a lot of uh, knowledge how they uh, use the materials more so than trying to find the result or um, control of the result in a contemporary art. That's something that I wanted to mention about ceramics in America. Here, uh, clay, for example, is made in a factory and it's, it's mixed so that the people can use this clay super easily and very expectable, very controlling and fire in the electric kiln. But um, in Minge world or in Kogei, Kogei ceramic, Japanese ceramics world, they, can, they use the ceramic clay that they can dig from the local spot and try the way it works geared like, um, leaning towards the material that they can use rather than have, trying to um, control the result. So that's a different approach that I think it's very different. Um, and I think that way it's a little bit more envir environmentally friendly. Um, I hope that America uh, goes, um, try to maybe cultivate a little more local materials and create the local famous crafts like so that people can go around visit places rather than franchising um, things, the same thing in everywhere. Sorry for criticism, but <laughs> yeah, living with nature. Um, Miwa, we have another question in the chat box. Uh, Katie Korn says, I love how your uh, sculptures have so much personality and warmth to them. Do you ever have challenges translating your imagined design to ceramic form? Also, they appear both stable and precarious. Is it difficult to make them balance on their feet? It is very difficult. I had always had difficulties with balance. All other artists in the studio like, oh, don't let it stand yet. Um, if America had the earthquake, I probably wouldn't have came up with this forms. I wouldn't have made it in Japan, honestly. Uh, this is a very reliable land that doesn't shake. Um, but it's, I'm getting better at it. Uh, and I have tried to make things that have four legs so that I will like a cat bath, but mm, I didn't, I don't, I don't know. I didn't like it. <laughs> I want to keep it to two surfaces. Thank you, Katie. Any other questions before we wrap up for the evening? Oh, one more. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Bonus slide. I keep coming up with this. Oh, no, that was from a quarantine. And when I couldn't do ceramics, I was making felt mobiles and paper cut, cut out pieces and pop out cards. <laughs> sorry. So yeah. those cards, is that um, watercolor on paper? It's acrylic and watercolor and watercolor pencil. Flowers are pencil. 
And you can actually take out the flower and put it in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's interactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Oh, I think this is a good time to wrap up for the evening. So thank you both so much, uh, Professor Field and Miwa Neshi for joining us tonight and sharing a little bit about your work and um, posing some really interesting questions. Thank you also to the audience for your questions and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much thank for your time. Professor you. Seifert, thank you, Miwa. It was a real pleasure. Me too, thank you, I'm so honored. Just See you next time. Thank you, thank have you. a good night, everyone. Bye, good night, Bye. thank you.